Good morning, Southeastern students and faculty and staff. I am so glad to be with you. This is, I think, your second to last chapel of the year. Now, do you know, I don't know if you know this, I I don't know if Dr. Aiken has ever shared this with you, how he picks the second to last speaker of the year. Uh, I know he's speaking next week, we're excited about that, or the end of this week. Uh, Here's what he does. Um, First thing he did was he thought, who is the best preacher that I know? And that guy said no, okay? But then he said, who is the godliest guy that I know? called that guy up. He also said no. He said, well, who is just the greatest theological mind that I know? And he called that guy up and I couldn't say no three times in a row, guys. So that's why I'm here today. Okay. (laughs) Guys, I've just, look, it is an honor to be here. We love to partner, Two Cities Church does, with all expressions of the body of Christ to fulfill the great commission. And so when we were building a residency, which we now have 11 residents in, and we're very excited about investing in the church of tomorrow by investing in the leaders today for the church of tomorrow, uh, we were excited to partner with uh, Dr. Aiken and Southeastern Seminary. And I wanted to give you a unique message today. If you'll type to, turn to, swipe to, scroll to, however you get to Acts chapter 20, um, I've got a word for you. I mean, I figure you're in college here. You're in seminary here. uh, You are on staff here. So this is what I think. And I hope you view yourself this way. Do you see yourself as a spiritual leader? I came here this morning to encourage you to see yourself as a spiritual leader. And we're going to learn from one of the greatest spiritual leaders, the Apostle Paul, right? Maybe you've heard this before. There's three reasons to believe in Christianity, I think. There's fulfilled prophecy all that Christ did in fulfilling the prophecy of the Old Testament, okay? There is the resurrection, which we always celebrate to defend the empty tomb. And then in my opinion, there is the life of the Apostle Paul. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 17, I'll meet you there in one minute. Here's what we're gonna see. Paul gives eight speeches in Acts. Now, early on, they're very evangelistic. He's leading all these people to Christ. That's really exciting. At the very end, I don't know what this means for us in our future. You know what the end of all his speeches are? He's in court. So we go from very evangelistic to in front of, you know, these court systems and heading to prison, okay? And in the middle, we get one talk to leaders. So Paul gives eight speeches in the book of Acts. Only one is given directly to Christians, and it's actually given to the elders of the church of Ephesus. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Here, Here, turn with me to Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Here's what it says. Now from Miletus... He sent to Ephesus. Okay, it's like 30 or 40 miles. That's like a day or two journey. Listen here. Um, He sent to Ephesus and he called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, now I'm gonna get there in a second. But listen, Paul had something that very few people have today. It's called convening authority. Isn't that awesome? Convening authority is I can call a meeting and people actually show up because they want to be around me, they, right? There's positional authority. Positional authority is I'm the boss, you have to do this, right? And you're like, you resent me for it and you wish you didn't have to do it. And then there's moral authority. Moral authority is you admire the life that I'm living and you'd like to be around me and learn from me. And that's what Paul had. So these elders, we don't know all the reasons why, these elders travel 30 or 40 miles to be with Paul. And Paul's going to share, and I've got to do this quickly, but Paul is going to share six declarations from his life, six principles, whatever you want to call them, six, you know, uh, commitments of a life on mission, okay? And here's what I want you to do. I want you to view yourself as a spiritual leader, and I want you to make it long-term. I don't want you to shipwreck your faith, okay? I don't want you to to burn out or blow up, right? Those are the two things that guys and gals tend to do. They burn out, you know, too hard for too long. They blow up. Their, you know, private light is Life is very different than a public life. So I'm going to give you, you'll see them, they'll rise right out of Scripture, six statements that Paul says. And I hope you'll take, maybe you can't take all six today, maybe you'll take one of them and you'll run with it. Okay, let's look at the first one. The first of the six statements, Paul says in verse 18, he says this, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. Here's the first commitment. I will live the Christian life in front of others. It's interesting. I mean, I guess many of us are in ministry. Whenever I preach this to my church, I always say, well, you know, when I preach this idea, I say something like, hey, you know, is it only you and Jesus who know you're a Christian at work? Well, when you're in ministry, I guess everybody's going to know you're a Christian, right? As soon as you tell them what you do for a living. But here's the question. Uh, Well, here's maybe the statement. 
the Christian life is, is both a belief system and a way of life, right? So you're here and we're at seminary, or you're in college, you're like, it's a belief system, and it certainly is. And there's systematic theology and historical theology and church history and we, we, biblical theology. We, we love all of that. And so we tend to think about Christianity with creeds and confessions and doctrinal statements. And I, I believe and love all that. But it's not just a belief system. It's also a way of life. In fact, here's something interesting, okay? The only way to know what you believe is to watch how you live your life. I mean, you are, I am, you are as well, the most complex creature on earth, okay? So do you think that you know what you believe? If you knew, if it was obvious what you believed, right, to you, we wouldn't need things like anthropology, uh, you know, psychology, therapy, counseling. I mean, look, here's how you know what you believe. You have to watch yourself like a stranger. And just like, as if you never met yourself before, what are you doing? And watch yourself use money, and then you can go, that's what I believe. You can't say, you know, you can have all the, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be generous, and it's all about stewarding what God's given me, but you have to watch yourself like a stranger. Here's my question for you. What life are you living in front of other people? Well, let me tell you what the average Americans are doing. It's called expressive individualism. <clears throat> expressive individualism is basically let me figure out who I am, and then let on the inside, and then let me spend all of my time trying to express that to everybody I meet on the outside by the car I drive and the house I live in and, you know, the clothes I wear. So Paul says, I lived a life in front of you, but he, he tells us more than that. Look at the type of life. Here, here's how he defines it. He says this. Here, here's his life, verse 19. <clears throat> Serving the Lord. That's, that's, that's how he lives his life in front of other people. Serving the Lord, it gives us three things. With all humility, and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How do we live our life, a Christian life in front of others? We do it by serving the Lord. How do we serve the Lord? We serve the Lord by serving people. I mean, you serve the God you can't see by serving people you can see, right? You serve God by serving people made in his image. And then he even says, look, he said, I did it in humility. John Piper, in talking about this passage, he points out that the word humility <clears throat> is probably better translated lowly, which means I feel, this is what John Piper said, it means this, I feel indebted to other people because of how good God's been to me. So it's something like this, or here's how I would say it. God does not need your good works, but other people do. And so he says, okay, so I've served it in humility and tears and trials. That's the first thing. Well, you see the second thing Paul says, if you turn with me to verse 20, here's what he says. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and from teaching you in public and from house to house. So the first thing he says is, I will live the Christian life in front of you. Here's the other one. And this is a big one right now for our culture. I will tell the truth even when it's hard. Do you see what Paul says there? Let me read it one more time. Paul says, I did not shrink, that's to be silent, from declaring to you anything, see, Paul believed it took the whole Bible to make the whole Christian, that was profitable in teaching you in public and from house to house. So what Paul's talking about is courage. I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said that courage, and I think this is true, is the virtue that every other virtue sits on top, sits on top of and stands on top of. Like, think about it. Like, if you're like, I need to confess a sin, why haven't you done it? Well, there's like five reasons, then there's one reason, Courage. If you need to you know, reconcile a relationship, why haven't you done it? Well, there's 10 reasons, but there's one reason, courage. You know, you need, what about you need to be reconciled to somebody else? It's like, you know, well, why haven't you been reconciled? Well, there's many reasons. Or why haven't you shared your faith? Well, there's many reasons, but courage is gonna be among the top of them. Paul said, I told you the truth. Now, what's interesting is we live in a time where people, we, we're, it's, I guess it's always been this way. We're tempted not to tell people what they need to hear but what they want to hear. You know this, if you know your Bible. Remember the Apostle Paul, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, hey, listen, at the end of time, people are going to seek out for themselves teachers who will tickle their ears, who will tell them what they want to hear. Now, that's always been true, but it's never been easier than right now, right? Because what do you do? Well, actually, there's a YouTube channel for that. And there's a podcast for that. And there's a New York Times bestselling book for that. If you want someone to affirm and confirm you, in your ungodly lifestyle, I guarantee you're gonna be able to find it. 
Now, let me just tell you what happens in our church. And many of you are pastors or you'll be pastors in churches. I know others of you will be missionaries. Let me explain. This is going to happen to you. <clears throat> so we have a, it doesn't matter what it's called. We have something called the Weekender where new people come into the life of our church. Think like a membership class, a discipleship class, an on-ramping class, a starting point, something like that. Well, probably every time we do one of these, <clears throat> people fill out some paperwork and we get this, this happens all the time, we get this couple and they have, uh, they live, they have one address, but two last names, you know, and they're not brother and sister, okay? And so I'm like, well, okay, I think that they're cohabitating. And we always try to be kind. You know, nice is not a biblical virtue, but kind is. We try to be kind. And so we call and we ask questions and we assume the best and we do a care call. And we basically say, hey, listen, you know, you're living in open, unrepentant sin. In fact, this used to be called living in sin. Okay. Do you think that they repent and they say, oh my goodness, we're gonna move out immediately, thank you. Unfortunately, they don't. Here's what they do. They say, well, it doesn't make financial sense not to. And, here, and they give all these reasons. And then here's what they do. They end up, we find this out later, they end up going to another church in our city who affirms and confirms what they're doing. Guys, some of you need to grow a spine and you're going to need to have some courageous conversations. What are you so afraid to talk about? Maybe you know this, but because the Bible transcends every culture, <clears throat> in every culture, in every time period, there's gonna be things that the Bible is going to be able to commend and celebrate. <clears throat> for example, we're building this building right now for our church, and there are so many things we have to do for this building for people who have disabilities like this parking, this ramp, I think it's great. That is very much in our culture, the image of God, in the sense that, oh my goodness, our culture is caring for the least, last, and leftovers of society, and they're saying anything you build has to be accessible to them. Wow, that's something the Bible would commend. <sighs> but every generation, there's going to be something that the Bible doesn't commend in that generation or in that culture, and it's gonna challenge it, right? It's going to not commend it, it's going to condemn it. and. You know what it's going to be usually, right? What's it going to be? Usually something with the New Testament sexual ethic and whatever the culture is currently saying. And here's the test. The test is when the Bible confronts you, because you didn't think that God was going to agree with you on everything, right? Obviously not. So when, when the Bible confronts you and says something that's the opposite of what you naturally believe or your culture is telling you, okay, then you have two options. Do I edit my Bible or do I change my life? Now, what's interesting is most denominations and most seminaries and most churches across time have decided they didn't say it out loud. We'll say the quiet part out loud. It's too painful to change my life. And so I'm gonna to have to edit the Bible and particularly what it has to say about sex and gender. Now, listen, lies are what make every other sin live. First thing he says is, I'm gonna live the Christian life in front of you. Second thing he says is, <clears throat> I will tell you the truth even when it's hard. Look here, verse 21. Testifying both to Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look here, this is important, verse 22. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit. See, this is the only time the Bible says that I can find, constrained by the Spirit. You know, baptized in the Spirit, yes. Filled with the Spirit, yes. You know, led by the Spirit, yes. Constrained by the Spirit, this is, this is the next level. Look what he says here. Constrained by the Spirit, <clears throat> not knowing what will happen to me there. Here it is. Except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions wait for me. Here's the third thing. I will submit to God's will for my life. You know, it's interesting. Every time I talk about submission, like, you know, when I talk about wives submitting to husbands, which comes up, you know, as you preach through books of the Bible, I have to tell the staff, I have to go, hey, guys, listen. We're, at the, we're gonna have to cut a song. The announcements are gonna have to be shorter. We're gonna have no video this week because I need more time. Because anytime you talk about submission at all, people just don't know what to do with it. Here's what submission means. Submission means, when talking about God, I accept what God has said and I accept what God has for me in my life right now and I trust him in the middle of it. See, here's what you're gonna realize. And many of you I'm looking at here, many of you are young. Okay, here's what you realize. You realize two important things in your life. I cannot change the past, 
and I cannot control the future. And so you submit in the present. That's what you do. You can't change the past, right? Some of you, you're so afraid that something from your past is going to show up in your present and ruin your future. This happens to people. You know it does. And and you you have to deal with your past. You have to go, okay, you know, I did that. I was addicted for a long time. Okay, I hid that for a while. Okay, I had some really dark years in college. Okay, my first marriage ended, you know. Okay, my son is a prodigal and broke my heart. You just have to deal with it. And you got to go, I can't change it. I mean, I wish I could. So then you have to submit in the present, okay? And by the way, Nietzsche said, sometimes you think you're done with your past, and your past isn't done with you, which is a terrifying thought. But then when you come to the future, it's like, well, you can't control the future, obviously. Let's just take a timeline of 20 years. What's going to happen to you in 20 years? You know what the future is, by the way. If you think about the future, here's what the future is. Where you and I are going to die. That's what the future is. Take in a long enough view, what is the future? Where you and everybody you know goes to die. That's the future. Okay, well, what do I do about that? Well, I I mean, what's going to happen with your parents? I mean, over the next 20 years, you know, we all tend to have these, even though we read our Bibles, unrealistic expectations. Yeah, my kids are going to be healthy. They're going to love the Lord. They're going to marry, you know, young. It's going to be easy to have babies. It's like probably none of that will happen. Okay, so then you have to go, okay, I can't control the future. And I can't change the past. And so I'm going to submit. Now, listen, do you see what Paul can submit to? Look what he says here. I'll read it one more time. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the spirit, not knowing what's going to happen. So sometimes you submit because you don't know what's going to happen. The unknown is very scary, right? You get a lump on your neck. What you want to know immediately is what is it? And as soon as you find out what it is, it's better than it being unknown to you. Paul says, I'm going to submit even when I don't know. But then look at this, what he says, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city, imprisonment and afflictions await me. Can you submit when it's hard? Right? It's easy to submit when life goes well. It's easy to submit when you're like, I got the raise. I got the great job at the church. You're like, you look up to the Lord, you go, Lord, I submit. When you trick that one girl into marrying you, you know, you're like, all right, Lord, I submit. You know, the girl of my dreams loves me. It's a lot harder. I mean, you know, I see this now as a pastor. I did college ministry for 10 years. I didn't see it as much. But you see people get old. And it's very, it's, it's very hard to be single, to be an older single woman. Like not, not cute, fun, single, ready to mingle. Like single and my biological clock is ticking. And I bought the KitchenAid mixer because I'm probably not having a wedding. And it's like, and, life, and I don't know that I'm, so I'm not, I'm not gonna be a mom. It's like, this is real stuff. And you gotta go, okay, I'm going to submit because I can't change the past. I can't control the future. Paul tells us how he does it. Look, he gives us a little bit more real real quick. He says this, but I don't account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. You've heard of that verse. Here's what Paul's saying. Translation, guys, I've done the math. It's actually an accounting term in the Greek. Guys, I've done the math. I get 30,000 days here. This is preparation to be away from the bodies, to be at home with the Lord. Suffering is the strategy that the gospel goes forward. I'm willing. That's what he's saying. But then he says this, the fourth thing he says, verse 24, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul says, I'm gonna live the Christian life in front of you. I'm gonna tell you the truth even when it's hard. I'm gonna submit to God's will for my life. And then here it is, I will run my race, and it's important, and I will finish it. You have to run your race. Listen, here's what happens. Like, I'm gonna... Here's what I want to say to you. I want to try to tell you that you're special without telling you you're a snowflake, okay? Here's what I mean by that. If you ever, I've got three kids, 11, 9, 7. Um, If you ever go to like a first grade classroom, all first graders are basically the same. I mean, there's a little introversion, a little extroversion, okay? But as you age, you become very different than everybody else. It's one of the reasons, technically, it's harder to make friends when you get older. Why is it harder to make friends when you get older? Because you're so unique, and so is everybody else. But that's why you can meet like someone at 18 years old in your dorm and you're like best friends in four days. It's like, because most 18 year olds are very similar. By the time you hit adulthood and you get married and you have your family and you do some suffering and you, and you, all this, and you get your education and you choose your career path, you are so unique. And here's what this means. Only you can run your race. This means a couple things. You can't run somebody else's race, okay? It's like sometimes people are like, my dad was awesome. It's like, your dad was your dad. You're not your dad. Your grandpa was incredible. It was a unique moment in history. He was unique. It was an opportunity. You can't be him. But here's the other thing. No one else can run your race for you. Okay, listen, please. 
If you don't run your race, then you leave a big hole, okay? I need you to run your race. Some of you, the story of your family is somebody didn't run their race. Have you ever seen that family before? It's like grandma didn't run her race. Or grandpa was an alcoholic, he didn't finish his race. And it affected my, my now wife and it's bled down into our, oh man, yeah, that's right. Now look, he says he runs his race. I mean, this is the language of a path. You know this, you've heard this said, I'm not the first to say this, that your direction in life is way more important than your intentions in life. You know, if I get on 40 West, when I leave here, if I get on, sorry, if I, if I leave here and I get on 40 East and I'm hoping to go to Asheville, if you're directionally challenged, you have to get on 40 West to go to Asheville, okay? But if I get on 40 East and I say I'm going to Asheville, it doesn't matter how much I pray about it, doesn't matter how much I plan, doesn't matter how excited I am, if I'm headed in the wrong direction, I'm never gonna get there. Some of you need to, and this is a great time to do it, college, seminary, great time to do it. Get on the right path. Because here's what happens. Anytime you admire someone, and what is admiration? Admiration is the natural reflex of your conscience. You'll look at someone and you go, I just admire them. You won't even, it's like, that's your conscience telling you something. Well, anyway, anytime you admire somebody, if you talk to them, say, say someone's super fit, you'll admire that naturally. And if you ever ask them, how did you get super fit? Here's what they'll never say. I don't know. I just have the six pack. I don't, you know, if you've ever met somebody who's got great kids and a great, and their kids want to come home and they don't need to come home anymore, and the husband and wife still love each other, and you ask how it happened, they never say, I don't know. They'll be humble about it, but they'll say something like, well, we valued family vacation, and we, the dining room table was sacred, and you've got to get on a path. You've got to run your race, not somebody else's, and you've got to finish it. So here's how, here's how races work. <clears throat> Some of you got a slow start, and that's okay. It's how you finish. See, what I've seen pastoring, and you'll, if you pastor in the Southeast, you'll constantly baptize people. This is at least our experience. You'll constantly baptize people who go, I'm not sure if I came to Christ like in the last six months or if I've just like been completely woken up spiritually. You ever meet these people? Maybe you're one of them. Here's what, because they'll say something like this. Why? I, I thought I prayed to receive Christ at 12, but I really didn't live much of a life in high school or college or in my single years. And I got married and I came here and I heard the gospel and I'm not sure like, and really what happened is you got a very slow start. Maybe you were a believer, but you had a very slow start. Other people get a very late start. Um, people come to faith in Christ, their thirties, their forties, their fifties. We love those stories. As a pastor who've met those people, it's very hard on those people. They're excited. They're, they love the Lord Jesus. They're grateful to be forgiven. They're grateful to head to heaven they wish they had come to Christ a lot earlier. You meet someone who came to Christ in their 40s and they're like, well, I didn't even raise my kids in the Christian church and our marriage wasn't based on Christ and the things I did in college. And the whole point is it doesn't matter whether you got a slow start, okay? Or whether you got a late start, it's how you finish. Paul says, I gotta finish. Which leads to the last couple of things he's gonna say. Number five, I'll, I'll use this one quickly. He says this, <clears throat> And now behold, remember, he's, he's about to leave. And now behold, I know none of you among whom I've gone about proclaiming the kingdom of God will see my face again. Paul says, guys, listen, I'm heading to heaven pretty soon. It's very emotional. I, I can get, if I'm in the right mindset, I can get emotional reading this passage. Um, here's, here's the final thing Paul's gonna say, and I'll show you, or the second of last thing Paul's gonna say. Um, I will think about the next generation. Uh, Paul is thinking about people and spending time with people who will outlive him. I believe, I'm sure you believe this too, I think churches should live longer than people. You know, people live 80, 90 years. Churches should live, we would hope, if they could be revitalized and all that and renewed. And they, hundreds and hundreds of years churches should live. And how do they live that way? They live that way by the current generation caring for and investing in the next generation. I wanna show you the two things Paul does as he's on his way out to help the next generation. You'll see, they're right in the text, but it's warn them and commend them to God. I'll, here, I'll show you. So he says this, um, verse 26, therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of you all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So similar to I told you the truth when it was hard, except he says I'm innocent of the blood. You may know this, it, Paul's using the language of a watchman. Let me try to do this quickly. Basically, back then, 
there would be men or a man and he would sit and he would watch for the enemy on the walls of the city. And um, if it's a military term, and if the enemy, if he saw an enemy coming, he would blow the trumpet and he would warn everybody in the city, danger is coming. And the rule, as far as I understand it, with the Jewish law was, hey, if you blew the trumpet and nobody listened, you're not in trouble watching, right? Because you ever seen this? You ever see it like, there's a category six hurricane coming right at Wilmington. And everyone in Wilmington's like, well, I'm not leaving. This is my house. Okay, well then, okay. This happens. People hear about danger, they don't leave. But it says that if the uh, watchman sees the danger and doesn't blow the trumpet, then the blood of the people is on his hand. Here's what Paul says. And we don't talk this way anymore. Here's what Paul, next time you read Paul's writings, see how much Paul talks about having a clear conscience. Paul, he just really cared about that. He, was, he really cared about having a clear conscience. And basically, here's what Paul wanted to say. I want to make sure you know before I go. And that's it. And sometimes it's, I want to make sure you know before you go. And let me just encourage you. This goes back to having courageous conversations with people. This is what you don't want to have happen. So let me just, this is going to be intense just for a minute, but this, ha- this happens, okay? Here's what you don't want to have happen. You don't want to find out that your mom or dad has some terrible stage four cancer and is going to be declining. This happens severely. And then you have to have the conversation with yourself. You know, self, I've been a Christian for 15 years and I've never had that conversation with dad. It's like, because I, I, you don't want to be on the other line of that. We're like, hey, look, he's not doing well. I don't know how coherent he's going to be. I've never shared. It's like, you do not want to have that conversation. And here's what you're going to realize in your life. You're going to realize, you're going to find yourself I think about my own life, okay? I haven't had, I've had a pretty normal life. I had a season in Pittsburgh. I had a season at Elon, as you heard. I had a season in Durham. I had a season in Greensboro. I have a season in Winston for however long I'm here. And you don't realize it till the season's over. You're like, that's it. And I'm not around those people anymore. And I want to let them know before I go. That's what Paul's saying. So he wants to warn them. Then he says this, <clears throat> Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. See, Paul could, could care about the next generation. Did you notice that? Because he didn't think that the church belonged to him. Too many churches, denominations, institutions, they go sideways because somebody at the top thinks it belongs to them. It belongs to the deacon board. It belongs to the pastor. It belongs to the three wealthy families. It's like, no, it doesn't. And that will hinder passing it on to the next generation. So Paul goes, I I got a deep conviction here. The church belongs to God. But then he says this, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. By the way, second time Paul talks about tears. You know, nothing will tell you more about yourself than what makes you cry and what makes you laugh, right? Have you ever laughed at the wrong thing? Like, oh yeah, a dark part of me thought that was funny, right? Yeah, yeah, well, the the same thing with tears. So Paul's crying again. He's like, guys, didn't I tell you all this with tears? Okay, Paul talks, I don't have time to get into all this, but Paul talks about there's dangers outside of you, okay? The dangers outside the church are persecution. The dangers inside the church are worldliness and false doctrine. And so Paul is actually, just from reading the text, he's actually less concerned, it appears in this passage, with the dangers on the outside. He's more concerned with the dangers on the inside. He talks about wolves. See, I want you to know this as well. If you're going to be a pastor, I don't want you to have an overly naive and simplistic view of the church. I think the average person who thinks about the church thinks, you know what the church is? It's shepherds and sheep. It's like, I wish that's what it was. I wish that's what it was. I wish that's all it was. Hey, look, here's all the shepherds, the staff and the pastors and and the community group leaders, and they'll they'll shepherd you. And here's all these great sheep that just want to be shepherded. It's like, actually, the Bible gives us a more complex picture. There's shepherds and there's wolves, right? And this is why whenever you do plant or pastor a church, you need to, you know, you need to make sure you protect the front door of your church for who's coming in. I mean, lots of Christians are innocent, borderline on naive and people get into the church, and not everybody has good intentions, okay? So there's shepherds, and there's wolves, and there's sheep, and there's goats, right? There's people who think that they're believers, and they find out, you know, you've, you've read the parables, you know what Jesus says. 
And so he warns about all of this, but then he ends with this. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, verse 32, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. So here's what you do. This is, by the way, this is what you do. I, I can tell you, I got an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, a 7-year-old. <clears throat> Every parent has this moment where their kids are going to college or trade school or into the workforce, and they basically say, okay, I've warned you as much as I could. Like, I, I, I told you marry a Christian, you know, and I warned you about the dangers of sin, you know, and I've warned you, I've told you the importance of a local church, whatever it is. Every, every parent who's a Christian parent has some moment of that, and then they have to have this moment where they go, and now I commend you to God. Commend means I place you in another's care, and I trust that person. So that's what every parent has to do. Paul's like, guys, I got other churches. I've got other, I've got other things to do. I can't sit here and babysit the Ephesian elders. So I'm going to warn you and commend you. And I'm warning you primarily about the trouble that could come in the church. You get it. Okay, final one. Uh, look at this, verse 33. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know how these hands minister to my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it is more blessed than to give than to receive. Now, do you find it interesting? I found this interesting. That the last words of Paul's last words right? So these are Paul's last words to the few notes. The last words of his last words are about money. You know, it's just like a little side note. If you're going to be a preaching, teaching pastor, you have to talk about money, okay? You have to talk about it every time it comes up. But listen, I mean, you know, people think that sexual temptation is the biggest thing in their life. It's not. You know, do you know what uh, Tim Keller said, you know, the late Tim Keller? He said, 40 years of ministry in New York City, no one one time in 40 years confessed to struggling with greed, Guys, it's Manhattan. That is the sin of Manhattan. Like, cities have idols. Boston is intellect, right? LA is fame. Miami is vanity, right? DC is power. Manhattan is money. That's the idol of the city, okay? So it's like, people don't realize what's going on. Here's Paul's final word, and we're gonna unpack it. I will always give more than I take. Um. We have to talk about money. Paul ends by talking about money. Paul says, I didn't covet your silver. See, listen, coveting is when you covet, here's what you say. God got it wrong. I should be married to him or her. I should have that job. My kids should be like that. I should live in that neighborhood, whatever it is. My kids should go to that private school. You'll be amazed at the things you can covet. (laughs) Um, Paul says, I didn't covet anyone's silver, gold. He even says apparel. He says, I didn't even want your Patagonia jacket. That's what he's saying, okay? He's saying, but this is important, guys, because you cannot minister to somebody you're jealous of. Are you jealous of your better-looking sister? You know, I mean, this happens to people. Some people are jealous of their coworkers. Paul's like, guys, listen, I couldn't minister to you if I was jealous of you. I genuinely, I'm aiming up. I want the best for you. So he says, I, I didn't covet anyone's silver. Then look what he says here. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those that were with me. <clears throat> in all these things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. So Paul said, instead of being jealous and coveting, I worked hard. Here's what some, I want to explain a little bit what's happening in our culture right now. A lot of young people are jealous because they're lazy. Okay, I mean, anytime somebody looks at somebody and is like, I don't know, let's pick an age. Someone's 50 years old. Like, look at the nice house he has. It's like, he's 50. What you do in life is you get a skill set when you're young and then you trade that skill set in for money. And then you acquire that money over time. And almost every old person would gladly give you their wealth for your youth. Okay. So, but, but, but so many young people, they're like covered in their mother's basement playing video games with Cheeto dust all over them, okay? It's like, I'm jealous. It's like, you're lazy. Paul said, I, I, I didn't want to be lazy. He said, I want to work really hard so that I could give to other people. Now, this is amazing. If you know the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was wealthy white collar. I mean, that was what he was. That's what he was his whole life. It's very hard for people who are wealthy and white collar to do blue collar work if they've never done it. 
Paul says, I, if you don't know Paul's story, Paul made tents. So then here's what he says. <clears throat> and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now this is interesting because Jesus never said that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. You probably know that, but this is part of the oral tradition or somehow Paul heard this or Jesus spoke these words directly to the apostle Paul and we've been misquoting them for years. Your grandmother or your aunt, your uncle may say, you know what, it is better. We say this at Christmas this year, right? Hey kids, get ready this year. It's better to give than to receive, right? It's like, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said it's more blessed. There is a spiritual benefit that comes into your life through generosity of other, toward other people. It's actually, because here's what you get. What is the blessing? You get the spiritual blessing you were looking in the material blessing. Listen, our advertisements know this. Have you ever seen, do you ever, remember that, remember that SUV they were trying to sell us? I think it was Cadillac or something. Do you remember who was driving it? Matthew McConaughey. Do you remember this? And everyone thought if I had that Escalade, I'd be like Matthew McConaughey. It's like, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. You wouldn't look like him. You wouldn't have his money, but it doesn't matter because they want you to think that that's what you have. Here, here's the final thing. Can you say, because this is what Paul could say, in every area of his life, I gave more than I took. I mean, maybe that's the next step. I, know, I don't know where all you are. Some of you have hard marriages. Some of you have, you're not the best parent, you know. You're an okay worker, you know. You're doing decent in school here. Maybe you could take a simple next step and say this. Well, I'm not the best, but here's something I could do. I'm gonna start giving more than I take. That could change your marriage. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm not the best husband, but today I'm gonna start giving more than I take. I'm not the best dad or mom, but I know the path forward up the hill is I'm gonna start giving more than I take. Could you leave Southeastern Seminary College and say, I gave more than I took? Because look how Paul ends, and this is where we'll end. He says this, <clears throat> verse 36, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of them all. And they embraced Paul and kissed him. And being sorrowful most of all, <clears throat> because of the word that he had spoken, that he would not, they would not see his face again. And they accompanied to him to the ship. This all ends with a gospel goodbye. A gospel goodbye is when a person or a group of people say goodbye because of the good news. When they move for the sake of mission, and as I was reading this this morning, I thought, isn't that exactly what happens at the seminary? In fact, I'm going to pray for us in a minute, but get ready for your gospel goodbye. It's coming, whether when you graduate, I mean, what are we doing up here? We're always bringing up these missionaries and these people, and we're saying, they're leaving. Give them a hug. We don't know the next time we're going to see them. They're going out for the, for the sake of the good news. Now, here's what's amazing. <clears throat> you know the person who said the first gospel goodbye? Jesus Christ. I don't know how it worked. But somehow he said a gospel goodbye to the Holy Spirit and God the Father and said, guys, I don't have to cross an ocean. I'm going to have to cross eternity. And if you look at the six things I told you that Paul said he did, Jesus did them all. Jesus, did he not just say, I live the Christian life in front of you? He said, I live the Christian life for you in my sinless life. Did he not say, <clears throat> uh, I will tell you the truth? No, he said, I am the truth. Did he not submit to God's will for his life and sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane? Did he not run his race for the joy set before him and say on the cross, it is finished? Did he not think just about the next generation, but every generation? And did he not always give more than he took? He didn't give some of his blood. He gave it all. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this seminary, for this school, for the staff, the students, the professors, just this institution and what it represents. I love the the phrase, you know, that we go because Jesus Christ first came. Lord, I pray that what you would do in, with these six declarations, commitments, principles, whatever you call them, whatever we're going to call them, Lord, that you would help us to, to live a life of mission like the great apostle Paul did. Lord, get us ready for the gospel goodbyes that are coming in our life, that are coming in the lives of our children as they grow. And let us be able to say in every environment, I gave more than I took. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.